The only way you learn about what to do next is by trying something to begin with. So my biggest lesson is from that is you learn by doing like that. That's what fuels your next step. So uh, you better just start trying things. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Founder Hour. We're hanging out with Jessie Janae. She's the CEO and founder of Lumi. They're a modern packaging partner uh, for e-commerce brands. Uh, really excited to learn your story and kind of dive in deeper. So uh, why don't we kind of start off from the sort of beginning, you know, where did you grow up and what was it kind of like and, you know, maybe your college days. Nice. Um, let's start from there. Awesome. All right. So nice to be here <laughs> with you guys. Um, we, yeah, so I... I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit, and um, and I, I ended up going to design school, which um, out here in California. And design school was not like a, a thing that I knew existed when I grew up in Detroit. <laughs> like everyone, I feel like everyone I knew grew up to be like a profession that like fits in like a checkbox, you know, All like dentist, like, car engineer. Like, yeah, like yeah. like a yeah dentist, doctor, lawyer, like accountant or whatever. Um, and uh, I. I, I mean, I, there's a lot of crazy things from my upbringing, but like I only went to three years of high school. I like just told my parents I just was going to move to California, even though I didn't know where I was going to go to school. But one way or another, I found I, I, I got myself out here and um, I ended up going to school for industrial design. Um, at a school called Art Center in Pasadena. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of interested now in, you know, the whole three years of high school. And, you know, I mean, you brought it up. I mean, <laughs> might, as well, just, that out there. might yeah. as well talk about it. <laughs> I'm um, not trying to paint myself as like a prodigy. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, like, so why don't you kind of delve deeper into that? Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I, I've always been, I guess it's less about the fact that I was like good at school and more about the fact that I was good at getting out of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, um, I don't know how many of you, how, like, I don't know if you guys had, like, a high school rule book or, like, did they ever give you, um, a calendar, like, a high school handbook and then at the back of it was, like, all the rules of your high school? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Because okay. I don't know if, like, every high school did that. So, like, I went I to a Catholic that. high school. Yeah. This beard that I'm rocking right now. Yeah. You couldn't have it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so we had like a rule book and there was like a little calendar in there, but, it, but the, like it was like an inch thick at the back with the rules. And I was like the type of student that instead of listening in class, I started reading all of the rules mm -hmm. of my school district. It was literally a printed booklet of all the rules of my school district. And I was just like reading one day and reading and reading and I found this like obscure like passage and like page 50 or whatever we talked about early graduation love it i know and it was like it was like literally a set of rules of like if you get the signature of your principal your two biological parents and your counselor you can get out of your senior yeah. year and wow. i was like I wish that I sounds that. infinitely doable yeah. like <laughs> that's great um cool so you uh so you go to art center like what you know you're you're into design what's kind yeah. of the goal for you at that point well, I I didn't even know I didn't know what industrial design even was. Like, do you guys like I don't even know if I forced you to like define it what what it is, but it's like um I just thought it sounded cool. Like legit, like I was like a 19-year-old who was like that sounds cool. Like I, I'm not trying to paint myself as not strategic, but if I there was this element, I guess the most profound I could put is like there's this element in my personality that I felt like I could teach myself certain aspects of like business or other things that I could pursue in school, but whatever what I was going to learn in industrial design school, I definitely didn't know. Yeah. Like, that's all I knew. I was like, I'm mm -hmm. definitely going to learn. And that's learn. very strategic. Yeah. 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 yeah, very. I'm definitely going to learn new things here. And so I I, I, I pursued that, and, um, and I found myself in this school up on a mountain in Pasadena that, ho that hovers over the Rose Bowl with 1,200 art school kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm like a hustler. Like, I found myself in design school, and I was like, whoa, like, what did I do? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, like, it's a different vibe. Art school is a different vibe. Like, yeah. um, and, I, and I don't know if I ever really fit in, but... Um, but it was definitely an interesting choice. There's still rules there too. Yeah, there's rules <laughs> there. Like how to but it, yeah, there's there's social rules. Like basically in design school, and I don't want to paint it all with one brush because there's a lot of different people there. But it's like, you know, people are not. It's like commercialism is bad. Like don't sell out. Like mm -hmm. what what are, mm -hmm. what's your art? Like are you gonna be a creative? Like a legit creative? Whereas I like 
always knew I wanted to start a business. Like I didn't think business was a dirty word or, you know, I, I was like, I, so it was, I had to mash a lot of elements in my personality to yeah. make that work. So you yeah. graduated high school early. I mean, and you said, you know, you kind of found yourself in LA, but uh, obviously you didn't just kind of find yourself in LA. No. You, you must be a little strategic yeah. to have started this company, but you know, why design? I mean, like I get it. You kind of want yeah. to just get into it, but you come out from Detroit to LA. Yeah. What is that transition like? Awful. Um, <laughs> like, honestly, you know, like, I, I could paint, like, a, I, like, I, my parents did not support that move because I literally said, like, I'm not going, I was supposed to go to U of M. I actually went to orientation and then I was like, I'm not going. I'm just going to get in my car and drive to LA. And, like, that's not a decision that my parents, like, supported. And so... Yeah. I had a little bit of money. Are the alumni of the school? The, yeah, my whole family is U of M alumni. Yeah. Oh, like, my, my my grandfather was, like, a quarterback. He, like, came home from World War II and then was, like, a quarterback on the U of M football team. <laughs> like, you can't you can't get deeper in than this, that. So, in the same league as Tom yeah. Brady right yeah. there. And, like, so. all my aunts were, like, in the sorority there and, like, whatever. So, yeah. um... So you're a big-time rebel. Yeah, it was it was definitely, like, not a good scene. <laughs> the... the, the because they there was they didn't understand why I would make that choice. I can just and, imagine a whole intervention, just like your whole entire family <laughs> sitting you down. They like, were just, they just thought <laughs> like, listen to us. I think that they they weren't mean about it, but they just were like, well, it was just like hands up in the air, like, yeah. well, we don't know what you're doing now, so it better work out, like kind of like like hope for the best situation, and um, they also. They, they weren't, like, super financially supportive of the choice, right, because it was a weird, crazy choice. So so I had a little bit of money that I'd saved from this, like, company I started when I was in high school, but not a lot. Like, not, not enough to, like, live in L.A. And so I think that, you know, I, I think about this a lot because running a company is hard. I'm, like, many years into this journey now. But when I look back, like... I don't know if I've lived through harder days than like moving to LA as a 19 year old with no friends and no support network and no money mm-hmm. and having to just literally like figure it out. Like I was, I remember, I, yeah, like I, it was just, you have to, you have to scrape it together and figure it out. I was like, I kept all my clothes in the trunk of a car. I was just like, it was a bad scene. So wait, you yeah. said you started a business in high school. What, yeah, what was yeah, the yeah. So yeah, it was called Janae Shirts and I would draw like illustrations and then I would, um, I would put them, I would screen print them onto t-shirts. Um, and that's where I got really into like the science behind printmaking and printing, which actually still serves me to this day. Like I make packaging, we, it requires a really mm-hmm. deep knowledge of printing processes. So everything's sort of connected, but, uh, but yeah, I was printing t-shirts and I created a website from scratch. It was terrible, but I like, you know, I did it in like my high school web design class mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, the whole thing. So yeah, so I, that was my first business. So how much of that, I guess, experience, you know, like in that type of, in, in that setting, yeah. like that business, yeah. like kind of led you to like enjoy that kind of feeling of like starting your own thing? I think it's a rate, uh, the way I think about it is like, it's sort of like a rate of learning. Like yeah. what I learned by doing that, one, I'm, every time I start something, I kind of like throw myself to the wolves. Like, so I started that business at 15. The next summer, I convinced my parents to, the only other time before I moved here that I went to LA, I convinced my parents to let me come out to LA to sleep on this family friend's couch for the summer to make my t-shirt business happen. Okay, literally, I sold them on this concept. So I was sleeping, I'm just, I'm 16 years old, sleeping on someone's couch in Studio City, and I was here for the summer for the stated purpose of making my t-shirt business happen. What does that even mean? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but what it meant to me was like, I literally took my shirts and like order forms and stuff around to store to store on Melrose Avenue as a 16 year old. And what I'm getting at here is like, I did all sorts of weird things, but, but what I learned, it's not like I sold a bunch of shirts and stuff that way. What I learned was the only way you learn about what to do next is by trying something to begin with. Mm-hmm. So, so someone, when I tried to sell them, shirts in a store asked me asked me if I knew about, about sales agencies and then showrooms and they introduced me to someone I had another conversation and long story short like my biggest lesson is from that is you learn by doing like that mm-hmm. that's what fuels your next step so mm-hmm. uh, you better just start trying things yeah I mean right there's like early stages of a, of a salesman right there master salesman <laughs> selling your parents on this whole move right I sold, yeah so yeah yeah I mean I think that you know, I was a convincing teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. I mean, you came out to L.A. not once, yeah. but twice. Yeah. And now, you, so you stuck around. I mean, you've been here now. Yeah. Um, so tell us about, you know, the journey once you moved here, you know, what you were involved in, how you started getting acclimated to, you know, life in Los Angeles. 
Yeah, so I was here. Um, I think, like, I probably had a weird L.A. existence. Maybe everyone has a weird L.A. story because L.A. is a weird city um, in many ways. But, like, I, you know, so I land here. I have no job. Um, I have nothing. I'm, like, living out of trunk of my car. Um, then I, I, the first thing I did was, like, I got an internship at a fashion company down by USC that was, like, I don't want to be mean, but it was like glorified sweatshop situation. Um, and, and so like I found myself as like this teenager from the suburbs, like kind of working in a sweatshop environment. Like I wasn't, I wasn't treated that way, but, but actually that's part of what I learned was like, I was off in this office and then it, I witnessed a lot of weird things. And, and so basically I got thrown head first and like, you're in a big city now, all sorts of weird things are always happening you gotta like navigate like what 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 path it's I, I i refer to la as like a choose your own adventure city like you could live any life you want here yeah. you gotta figure it out and and faster the better kind of because because mm-hmm. <laughs> things can go awry like it's so so um i jumped from thing to thing like i did some internships and then i and then i was like i want to go to school and that's when i found art center and i think when i started going there you know i found more it's where i met my co-founder like mm-hmm. i obviously started meeting some great people there yeah, so um, most, you know, students in college are kind of like going through these four years of, uh, you know, grinding and, and trying to learn as much as possible, keep their GPA up to get the best yeah. job they can out of college. It sounds yeah. like you didn't have your eyes, uh, your sights set on like trying to go and work somewhere. Um, you were no. like very entrepreneurial. So yeah. did you start Lumi in college or did it start as something else? Was it after, you know, you went, you know, you graduated, yeah. started something else? No, started, started Lumi, started the first version, like this, this fabric dye product that we, that we launched on Kickstarter. Uh, um, I met my co-founder in, in school. He wasn't my co-founder first. He's just my friend, obviously, Stefan. And, um, we launched a Kickstarter campaign in 2009. Um, so I was in school when we launched the Kickstarter campaign though, it wasn't like we're launching a company. We, we, for all we knew it would fail for all we knew, like people would have a little bit of interest, but not much. So, so it wasn't the mindset. Like the mindset was, let's try this thing. Let's experiment. Let's try this new platform. Um, and it was really, really fun. And so we launched our first campaign, raised $13,000, which at the time was a really big Kickstarter campaign because mm-hmm, yeah. of the first year of Kickstarter, there's still a lot of campaigns that are raising like two grand or three mm-hmm. grand or five grand. So we did that. And, um, and we, it's, to do a really early Kickstarter campaign was a really interesting experience. Like, we had to explain to everyone who pledged, we had to explain what it was. Mm-hmm. We had to be like, this is Kickstarter. It's new. Here's how you do it. Like, yeah. I mean, it's so early. So when we did that, though, when we succeeded, um, it definitely set a stage for, like, we never stopped. From there, like, we still were in school for, like, another year and a half, but we never stopped working yeah. on, on the business at that point. At a certain point, we dropped out, so we didn't graduate. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, uh, so I mean, like this, uh, this wasn't just even the start of Kickstarter, uh, sorry, uh, like crowdfunding, but just yeah. crowdsourcing in general, like just, yeah. you know, the leveraging like social media and just, you know, these large networks, uh, for one unified goal, if you will. Yeah. Um, so like, it sounds like, you know, you were really early to jump on that. Yeah. Was, was it kind of like, no question about it, we're just going to give it a try? Or did you like feel like you, you know, you knew you were going to be successful doing that? It was total experiment. Like, I think, I'd, I don't know how familiar you guys are with, like, the maker movement and, like, maker fairs and make magazine and, like, that whole vibe of, like, DIY and everything. But for one, we had a product that fit into that market, this fabric dye, like, that first company we ran. Um, the product was called Inco Dye, and it's this light-sensitive fabric dye. And so it's a it's a DIY product. Like, we mm-hmm. were selling it to hobbyists and teachers, and we sold kits in Urban Outfitters. That's later. That's, like, 2012. But, like, but, but we... The, the, what I'm getting at here is that, like, um, you, we were, the vibe of that whole time, if you were kind of part of that movement, was, like, just, tr- like, try it for the sake of trying it. Like, what, it would be crazy not to go out directly to the customer and ask, do right. you want this, before you start investing in it. It's you have nothing a, to lose. Yeah, it's a really, yeah, really, you have nothing to lose. It's, yeah. like, a very different energy, um, very not calculated. There, there was no such t- thing at the time as, like, a well-orchestrated Kickstarter campaign yeah. with a marketing agency. Yeah, like, right. everyone was just, like literally like turning on their eyesight camera and being like hey world <laughs> i made a product yeah what do you think you know yeah. and it was um and there was a kind of an innocence to that yeah yeah and nowadays it's just like super professionally shot 
content. Like, people ask me for advice, you know, and I'm viral like, viral movements. I don't have advice for people doing Kickstarter campaigns right. now. Well, that's not true. I, I do, and I really still believe that the story people people pull out their credit cards in Kickstarter because mm-hmm. they believe in the people and right. the story. But I, but but for people who are doing those like highly orchestrated campaigns where they're like it's already venture funded mm-hmm. secretly mm-hmm. and yeah. they've got marketing agencies and stuff like. Mm-hmm. They're like you were successful, and I'm like, yeah, I can't, I can't relate to what you. I wasn't successful in the same way. Like I was mm-hmm. doing a different thing at the time. You totally, know? yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you, you kind of mentioned it, Ingo Die. Yeah. Um, this is kind of like your first venture, if you uh-huh. will. You have a pretty interesting story about how you got this. This formula existed, right? Yeah, Before you yeah, even yeah, like. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. what happened with that? Oh man, yeah. I've been. I feel like I've already lived too many lifetimes <laughs> for 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 one lifetime. Um, but yeah, like. That's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I going back to the t-shirt thing, right? Yeah. So I get obsessed with printing, t-shirt printing, and like, and it occurs to me through a variety of means. Actually, I was in like a photo 101 class in high school, and I got obsessed with like, wow, photo like printing in a dark room is really badass. Like, you walk in with an idea and like a negative, and you walk out, and it's like done. It's kind of magical. Yeah. It's chemistry, but it's magic. And um, at the same time, I'm running this little t-shirt company. And there's a part of, there's like a light bulb that goes off my brain, which is like, why can I not do this beautiful photo printing process, but on my t-shirts? Mm. And so that was like the basic idea. And and, um, and 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 then like, I guess this just speaks to like how hard my brain holds onto an idea, like a little weird clenched baby fist, like where, where basically I was like, that would be cool. And then I was like, must do that, must do that, must do that. And, and my first thought was like, someone's already done that. There must be some cool fabric chemistry thing. I started searching for it, couldn't find it. And then I started buying like obscure books about printing um, and like print processes and textile stuff. And I find a reference to like a thing that sounds very similar to what I'm trying to do. And I mean, this is like a rabbit hole, but basically like there's three years of my life where I'm like, basically stalking someone that has the, this like information about this weird dye formula and they're up in the Bay Area and I'm By information, Detroit. do you mean like patented or It's is a trade it just secret kind of like, okay, um, and gotcha. it was like this, this like, um, there was this formula kind of developed by this um, Stanford chemist who then ended up running a commercial paints company in the 40s. We're talking, like, this is what I'm talking wow. about. This yeah. is some weird like stuff. Some yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then he sold that company to uh, to another guy who then ran that company through the 80s and then retired. And I'm trying to hunt down that guy to be like, what about this formula? So, like, literally imagine being stalked by a teenager when you're, like, retired you're like a retired paint person okay and he's like literally he was like stop calling me like (laughs) he was like i don't like i don't know why you're doing this like no one cares about this formula like no one needs this stuff and um for three years i stalked him he didn't have an email address so i had to write him physical letters this is what i'm doing at home as a teenager and then finally he's like fine like yeah like you this is he realized it was no longer just like a teenage fancy like maybe I was really serious about this after like three years he was like okay like we can meet about this and and there's like even more story from there but but I I basically convinced him to let me use the IP if I bought all of his like old dead stock inventory um and so I we I ended up buying that for I ended up buying that from him and then and then I ran that company for four and a half years and I had to perfect the formula it wasn't like ready made. It was just like um, I had to become like a chemistry person. So it's not like you bought the trade secret. You bought his inventory I to be able to use. I bought his inventory to be able to because that because that 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 started teaching me the first elements of like the art of the dealer, or whatever you want to call it. Which yep. is like he didn't want to sell the trade secret. Like he he wanted to get rid of this inventory sitting in a garage. So finally, I was like, okay, if that's what you want, I'll come pick up everything in a U-Haul truck. But you gotta like tell me about this chemistry. And so this was like, this was like after <laughs> your Kickstarter. Deal. Yeah, this is after your Kickstarter campaign. No, no, no. This is all before. Wait, wait. I'm trying to make, not get the math wrong. No, this is um, that's like that's basically happening simultaneously or like a little bit before that first Kickstarter campaign. This is while I'm still in school. Like, th- this is how. Yeah, it was like totally. That was a crazy decision to, like, tell this guy, like, I will come and buy this stuff from you. I had, like, no idea if there was a market for it. So, actually, like, the first Kickstarter campaign is happening when when I'm still, like, crafting that deal with him. And I was kind of, like, testing out the market of, like, can I really do this? Am I going to really make money if I do this? And then I think I completed the deal with him soon thereafter. So, at this point, you're just kind of going based off of what your passions are and just kind of pursuing those? 
Yeah, yeah, and I think that's what's interesting about, like, not getting a degree in business is, like, um, there was no, you know, market analysis of, like... Nothing, yet. yeah. and I, no one would ever no have done... No feasibility test or whatever. Yeah, but that's what's fascinating. That is That sticks with me, though. No one would have ever done that company if they had done any sort of MBA analysis right. on that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Never. No. There's no... What's the target market size for a photographic fabric dye. Have you done a concept test? Have you gone and interviewed everybody to see if yes, they'll buy this or yes, they'll pay for it? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't That's know. That's everything, my whole class. Yeah, like, you, and so that it, but it, that kind of, that sticks with me in my entrepreneurial heart because like, yeah. sometimes the best ideas like, would never pass muster from an MBA. It's like, you, because, some part of it sucks in mm-hmm. in a some way, but we sold millions of dollars worth of that fabric dye. You know, I think, I think, when you go to law, uh, business school, or you know, get get your MBA, it's more about how to break down those ideas and be like, yeah, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to entrepreneurship, where you're just like, I don't really care what the, you know is you, in that textbook. I'm just gonna try it anyways and figure out to. another solution. You have to push through. You have to pierce through because, like, you, um, piercing through like an idea that sounds bad or trying something out in the market. That there's. It, Maybe it is a bad idea. The the good idea is on the other side of the bad right, idea. Right. And if you never tried the bad idea, you, you won't never, discover the good you're one. You're never gonna get there. And if you spend all your time spreadsheeting, market sizing, like you you're probably not gonna find that right. thing, you know. So you do Inco Dive for what, four or five years? Yeah, from like two thousand nine to two thousand fourteen. Okay. Yeah. And and does that sort of change like Transform into Lumi, or is it? No, we, it's confusing because we call we like you we call both things Lumi at different times. I just really like the name Lumi, um, and I actually have a, a diary entry from like me when I was a teenager that said like I shall run a company called Lumi. And <laughs> really, yeah, yeah. So that, yeah. that's how you came up with the name. Was... Yeah, well, well, Lumi for the dye company made more sense because it stands for light, like illumination. Yeah. Right. But so, but then we've got like Lumi.com. We got all the Lumi handles like facebook.com slash Lumi like we, we I fell in love with the name and I'm not saying I'm gonna call the rest of my whole entire <laughs> life Lumi but it, but it's like I liked it enough to keep it for this company but we they're two separate companies like we literally that was that was an LLC a California LLC right. we shut it down we started a whole new entity we just called it the same thing <laughs> so, that's funny yeah <laughs> Cool. So yeah. So you start you start Lumi. Um, and, you know, you're you're printing on at the time T-shirts and different yeah. kinds of like mugs and things like that. Yeah. Um, what happened? Like why boxes? What happened? Like, yeah. Yeah. So packaging. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like the jump from fabric dye and everything yeah. to this. Like yeah. yeah. That's a crazy. That's a definitely a crazy jump. Um, we, I think there was a certain amount of biz- business m- momentum that I understood to the dye company, which is like when you have a niche product, that um with a certain very specific type of audience. Um, you you go out and you sell you saturate the market like at a certain point everyone who's ever going to buy that product has bought it pretty much um, and I feel like we we're reaching that point in 2014 and so you have to ask yourself a pretty hard question there's different models you either launch Incodai 2.0 right mm-hmm. you tell everyone throw out all your original Incodai let's make a new one you create a new kit you decide to launch adjacent products like new tie dye kit or some who knows what I decided, I, I think that it was a kind of a crazy choice, and it was also my co-founder and I, Stefan, talked about this a lot, strategized a lot together, but we made the choice, like, we don't want to do any of that. We could have. We could have launched new Anchor Dye 2.0. I had a whole I had distribution into all these art supply stores. We could have made some decent money with that and stuff, but we decided, like, maybe let's say this idea, we did it. Like, I think that's an interesting concept of a business, is people expect a business to like never end, right? Like a mm-hmm. business is a thing that you start mm-hmm. and ending it is supposed to be like a failure, right? Well, if there's no return or, or if someone got, you know, had a bad result, sure, you could call it a failure. But but I think in the first business, which is primarily bootstrapped, we launched a product, we sold as much of that product in the market as humanly possible. It was a profitable success. And then one day I said, I'm not going to sell this product anymore. I'm going to start a new business. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's crazy, kind of a crazy choice. But at yeah. the same time, it's like, um, I think too many entrepreneurs stick with something for too long, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, it, it, if I had been, if I was running Incredi now, I think it would be... Uh, it, it's almost like that sunk cost of like the like all that time that you spend building it. Yeah. When you've come to the re- realization like, all right, there's nothing more here. Yeah. I need to sort of you know pivot into something. Yeah. 
or like keep doing this knowing that there's n- no end of the road like clear tunnel yeah. of, the, of the tunnel so it's like yeah and it was like a tough it was a tough 2014 was a tough year it was ironic because like so it was a, the, our biggest year in sales of Incoda yet uh, so it was not like the company was flagging it was our yeah. best year ever mm-hmm. profitable um you know uh there was all we could have we could have p- done a lot of things with that entity and to make the decision like but i was very unhappy like because i was i steph and i are ambitious people and we were running a dye business for four and a half years i'm not knocking it because i love mm-hmm. that product mm-hmm. super passionate about it but like i wanted to do something new and i, and I think that yeah that, that that's the other thing like i think sometimes entrepreneurs look at it as like Closing that business, does that make that business a failure or that product a failure or or do I have to like throw it all away? I think I we kind of like looked inside ourselves and were like, actually, um, we learned so much yeah. mm-hmm. running that company. What else can we do with that knowledge? Right. And now we have this. And you've yeah. proven it. Like at this point, yeah. like you have the credibility. Like if you wanted to go out and raise fun- funding for yeah. a new, new venture, like they, they would see that. They yeah. Would know that. Yeah. It definitely didn't hurt when we were raising our, you know, seed round for this company and stuff to be like, hey, we're not just some random people. We can point to this other profitable right. business we grew. Yeah. Right. You know, it's funny we were having that discussion today about like you know selling a company that you started or even you know just you know just shutting it down, but then going on to the next project and saying, hey, look, you know we've done it, whether it failed or not, yeah. we've done it. We've seen the process. We've learned from our mistakes, and now onto new ventures kind of thing but what you know you said that you wanted to do something new yeah you know why loomy.com why yeah, yeah. packages yeah. why you know why what we see today yeah so i think steph th- this is like um i know it seems like a weird jump like fabric dye packaging mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. um there are some connections some like real knowledge connections about how much we learned about manufacturing mm-hmm. supply chain mm-hmm. printing processes that all relate to this but there's another thing, which is like we are building the company now that we wished existed when we were product-based entrepreneurs mm-hmm. the first time around. Like we're making a tool that we didn't have, um, and that I think is really, really exciting and um, and really, really fulfilling. We but here, here's one way of thinking about it. Seth and I consider ourselves beneficiaries of some really incredible companies that I'm sure you're all familiar with, like mm-hmm. Stripe, Square, um, Milchamp, Which will kind of talk about your Shopify. white combinator journey. Yeah, yeah. like all, all those companies, like we, Steph, we were, for our first business, Incodile, like we were using everything I just mentioned, we were using all those products within the first six months or 12 mm-hmm. months they launched mm-hmm. because we were like hungry for solutions. Right. We were like, oh my God, thank God Shopify's around. Oh my gosh, thank God Stripe. Like before that, we were like, whatever. We were like going to our mm-hmm. bank branch to open a merchant account or whatever. So so I guess what I'm saying is like, we had this muscle memory for what a really great solution for entrepreneurs feels like. What it, And we watched those companies grow as users. Mm-hmm. And now we're like seeing, we saw the kind of dawn of like experiences, dawn of like direct to consumer business models, which Kickstarter is an early prototype of. Mm-hmm. What 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 do you call a direct-to-consumer model except someone getting on a camera and going, hey, I have a product idea. Do you guys want it? That's direct-to-consumer if I've ever seen it. So, like, you know, like, basically, there that's, like, an early form of, of all these models you see proliferating mm-hmm. now. And, and so now what we're asking ourselves is what's missing from that picture. If you can launch, if you can have an idea on a Friday about a product you want to launch, and um, by Sunday morning, you've got a Shopify store live. You've got, you know, um, fun photos that you took yourself because that's so easy now. And you've got a MailChimp and all this stuff. What are you missing? Well, you probably aren't an expert in physical supply chain yet. You probably aren't an expert in shipping and um, the supply chain and logistics. There's other companies working on this stuff, too, from Flexport to, you know, um, 3PL fulfillment companies like Shipwire and all sorts of others. But it's like... You start to ask yourself what's missing, and, and this this packaging supply chain piece seemed very missing. <laughs> yeah, which is which is really cool because uh, important too. Because when an entrepreneur kind of looks, sometimes you're looking at a market and trying to solve or create a solution for a problem that doesn't even like the solution doesn't even exist. Yeah. Uh, or let alone like looking at a market that could be saturated, or yeah. um, you know, there's just like a gap that you notice because you experience that pain yourself. And you yeah. know, like 
there's something missing here. I'm going to fill that hole and yeah. something's going to happen. Yeah. Um, which is, yeah. And it's, it's funny too, cause like I was looking at your client list and like, yeah. you have some clients that I would have never imagined would use boxes like intercom, like, yeah. Yeah. like intercom and stuff. Right? I know, like, I know. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, the physical world, like I've, I've always been, I don't know if it's maybe this maybe harkens back to my Detroit roots, but like I've always been fascinated by manufacturing in the physical world. I have this silly saying that I used to say to Stefan, which is like, you can't eat bits for breakfast, which is like super stupid. And I get, <laughs> I'm telling you about that. But anyway, but the point is like, as, as obsessed with digital technologies that we all are and how like they're addictive and they make our world feel easier, like at some point they have to cross over. Like you, you can't eat them for breakfast. You have to get, you know, you can't warm yourself with a digital coat and like you know use some digital thing to get your package to someone's doorstep at some point this the digital like slaps right into the physical and and I think that the I think there um maybe it has taken this many years for there to be a crop of entrepreneurs who've like lived through some of that to create this next wave of solutions mm -hmm. um so because I, I see it happening like there's this Lumi is, I feel like, is part of that wave, but there's other companies doing things as well. So, yeah. Jesse, for those that haven't heard of Lumi, what's the kind of best way yeah. for you to describe it to, yeah. to them? Yeah. So, um, Lumi helps brands source and manage um, their custom packaging to get their... The, it's, we say it's a packaging solution for modern brands. And mm -hmm. what we mean by that is, like, modern brands are typically going direct to consumer. Modern brands typically... Mm -hmm. Uh, think that packaging matters because packaging is kind of the modern storefront. You don't mm -hmm. doesn't used to matter ten years ago whether you got into Nordstrom's. Now it matters whether your box is memorable and, and when it's sitting right. on a New York stoop. You know, like mm -hmm. the world has changed, and so the solutions need to change. And so at Lumi.com, you you um, you can tell us what you need, what you're looking for. You know, you can send us your product even, and we can physically engineer the box around it. And then all the way through, what we really are is a supply chain company. Right. We have companies launch, like um, the founders will launch a company in there in New York, but they're shipping out of Reno and Kentucky and a city in Europe. And they need boxes in all those locations. So we can set them up with a Lumi dashboard. We build out the physical specifications of their box. We can produce in those three locations, and okay. they don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So that that without something like Lumi, that would be tremendously difficult like way more than a 10 person startup could ever handle right. like the logistics of sourcing from three yeah. countries or whatever to do it in-house yeah it's so it's yeah you know i wouldn't be asking this had i not gone to law school and i hate that i'm asking this question Go for it. but it's 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 interesting to me because i just and i was just thinking about it while you were talking was when you customize these packages for each of these different companies or yeah. brands is there any like IP that belongs? Is the yeah. IP yours or is it the brand? That's that's a really interesting question. Actually, I was I was uh, thinking about this subject recently, and we have a pretty simple terms of service. Like it's pretty straightforward. Like all of the brand, everything related to your brand mark, your graphics, everything that signifies you your as your brand is yours. And 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 when you share those files with us, like you retain ownership of those files mm -hmm, and that that mm -hmm. stuff. The structural engineering of a box, like. You know, uh, like I'll give an example. Like, let's say your box has a handle on it. Right. Well, there's like, there's only so many ways to put a handle on a box. Right, like, yeah. let's just say there's four ways. Well, I, you can't own that handle. Like, you're gonna see that handle yeah. on thousands of other boxes mm -hmm. from other brands because because it's um. It relates to how packaging is engineered and designed. Like, there's only so many ways to do a handle. So unless someone has like an actual copyrighted, like or you know, or patented, patented or trademark yeah. design that's very specific to them, mm -hmm. the structural engineering part is is um, it's it's not even our IP. It just right. is pub. It's almost public domain. It's gotcha. like you can't expect it to be only used on your. Gotcha. Brand. Yeah. 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 I was just randomly thinking about yeah, that because no, I was like, there's so many brands really, that you could work yeah, with and yeah. so many different problems. You're gonna, I don't want to get into the law. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but it, it's it, it, it's a, it is a fascinating thing. I think that, um, but, I, but I think the graphic stuff clears it up. Like, right. you know, the, the brands are, the, to, for clarity, we aren't a design agency. Right. We help you produce and manage these supplies. Exactly. So you did the design. Your, your totally. team supplied it to us. So we don't, um, like... Uh, we, we produce what you design. Yeah, and I was focused yeah. more so on the design because, you know, when you talk about modern storefront, yeah. you know, which I think, I, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that phrase because, you know, at this point, people are just ordering on Amazon. Like, that's yeah. it. It's on Amazon. It's getting to your door more so than you are going out to the malls or whatever, shopping centers. And so when you do open that up, that tiny little store is kind of like your own, like, design, own. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the only, it's kind of crazy. Like, for most brands these days, you know, launching online, that box is the only physical touch point they right. will ever have with that customer 
aside from their product. So it holds quite a it holds a space in people's brains. Like they and and then and then you see like um, I did a talk one time where I, where I used photography of like my own photography of street shots from New York of like blue apron boxes sitting on stoops and away boxes literally being like thrown out of a UPS truck and it's like these are these are the scenes of our life now everyone's seen this stuff and if they're if you can't pretend it's not sinking into your brain you, mm-hmm. you're remembering it like that this is the yeah. new marketing you know totally totally yeah because yeah, it's not only like an experience for the actual customer but also people around them like if mm-hmm. they want to reuse that box or if yeah. it, like you said it's sitting on someone's stoop like everyone who walks by sees that and like, yeah, yeah. That? yeah yeah um, yeah exactly yeah um, so let's talk briefly about Shark Tank because you were on Shark Tank oh, and this is kind of <laughs> right you know you know we have to bring it up for those who haven't seen it it's probably one of the best oh, segments because it just gets really heated yeah, 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 um, so yeah, kind of yeah. tell us about a little bit about that experience and how kind of that affected your, um, I guess, you know, the the path of Lumi, if that if yeah, that at all. it's kind of a crazy. So I did Shark Tank for the fabric dye for Inco dye, and I filmed it in late 2014, right when we were thinking through what are our next steps for Inco dye. So it's kind of like, in a way, although most people probably don't know this, it's almost like I lived publicly this moment of figuring out my next step for this company because we were thinking like about all these different crazy ideas we could do and and I was I was just down to experiment. I was like down to try things. And so applied to Shark Tank, got on the show, pitched all the fabric dye stuff, told them that we had all these new ideas for other kits and other things we wanted to do. In reality, like they pit, they they throw terrible deals back at you. They throw like <laughs> loans for equity, and I, like yeah. we already had bank lines of credit and stuff. And I was Mr. like, Mr. Wonderful, I assume. <laughs> yeah. So 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 I, so I, we get some offers, but they're all not great. And I walk away from the show. You held your ground. That was great. I held my ground. <laughs> Mark Cuban said, "Good job sticking to your guns." That's what everyone remembers. Like I still get emails from people that are like, "Good job sticking to your guns." Like they just parrot him. <laughs> That's it. It's actually the world is kind of fascinating that way. Like everyone parrots Mark Cuban in a weird way. Um, so so, but anyway, like I came home from that, and I remember actually feeling like lighter, being like, now. It dawned on me, like they, they, they're smart people. It is campy, it's a show, but they're smart people. And they pummeled me with questions about like why I was doing this and why I would want to do next steps and stuff. And I went home and I was like, you know what? They're right. Like I don't want to do this. Like, like it was like actually like a clarifying moment of um. They had really good questions that they asked, and I went home and I thought to myself, um, those questions are good. My answers were okay, and I actually think that I want to do something else. Um, and but here's the here's what's awkward. I filmed that in late 2014. Probably released like between what? October when I filmed that in 2014 and De- and um, in December, I, I, I moved fast. I decided I want to do a new thing, figure it out, create a create a business idea, apply to Y Combinator, get into Y Combinator. I met Y Combinator in January. Three months later, two and a half months later. When my episode airs for my fabric dye, mm-hmm. I'm in Y Combinator oh. doing the new thing. <laughs> oh my god! So were they like? So it's not even marketing for you at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it just imagine like Y Combinator is stressful enough, um, <laughs> and 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 you've got the Y Combinator partners who are all like. You know, well, I was a bunch of, about to say they're all tech bros. There's now some tech ladies as well, as well but there's, but uh, whatever. Anyway, we won't, we won't get into that. But anyway, the, the, they're like, they don't, they think Shark Tank is a total, like, they think it's for losers or whatever. Like, um, and so, so I have to now deal with that. Like, deal with the fact that I'm like up in Silicon Valley in this like rarefied so, like, environment. PR crisis. Where, where we're all dealing with like the future of humanity, right? Mm-hmm. And then I'm on Shark Tank. And it was like, <laughs> oof. Anyway, I've li- I've weathered it. So yeah, kind of the segue into, <laughs> segue into, into Y Combinator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that experience because, um, mm-hmm. you know, obviously for those who don't know Y Combinator, I, I mean, I assume everyone knows at this point. Yeah. Uh, they've harbored and helped grow some yeah. of the largest companies these days, yeah. including Airbnb and Dropbox, like, yeah, Dropbox Stripe, Stripe. Um, yeah. yeah, Reddit. It's a, it's a phenomenal experience for a founder. So um, I think that you know it's a phenomenal experience for a founder. I th- sorry to cut you off. This was Sam yeah, Altman yeah. was the who was heading it up at the time. Yeah, Sam Altman. Yeah, Sam Altman was <laughs> leading at the time. Although Paul Graham was like we had office hours with mm-hmm. him. He was around. Um, uh, Amazing. Yeah, he he was he was around. Um, but I would here's how I put it. And and 
it's like anything. Everything is such an individual experience. And, and I almost want to put out a disclaimer, like, which is my fundamental belief about all business advice is like anyone who tells you there's one way of doing it, like that's the worst advice you've ever heard. <laughs> like, so, so my, my advice about why Combinator is like, it was great for me. It might be terrible for someone else. Like, I don't know. I'm not in charge of your journey here, but mm-hmm. like, but he, but the reason why I think it was great for me and for us was that we I went to school for design, okay? Then I ran a bootstrapped company. To jump into the world of venture-backed startups and to understand how the ecosystem works, I can't imagine a faster way of doing that than spending three months living in Baton View and doing my Combinator. It's, it's like three months, it's like five years of information packed into three months. It's very stressful to get five years of information in three months, mm-hmm. but, but then, and I'm not professing to be some sort of expert in Silicon Valley now, but I'm just saying like, you learn really fast. You learn the language, you learn how you talk, you learn how to pitch things, you learn what everyone's worried about, how they do their metrics. Like, it's just so much information. The amount of coffee meetings you'd have to do to learn that amount of information is insane. So so for me, I think it was very valuable. Um, and we came out of that experience and raised a great seed round from great partners. And so I, I, like, I have zero complaints. Yeah, uh, tell us about Paul Graham. Is he as hardcore as they say he is? Uh, he he wasn't for for my personal experience was that he um, I think he's intense he's an intense person of course. Um, he we've remained in touch um, a bit uh, mainly over email and like he'll just give like really frank feedback over email um, the the but the, for me though like. I think that when he was a little bit more involved in the day to day of White Company, I've heard crazy stories, but it was a little bit more. This is again just my experience, but like it was a little bit more. I think he was a little bit removed and it was a little bit more of this like grandfatherly or fatherly figure where I think he felt a little bit more chill. Like, um, and so yeah. he was, I mean, to be my entire experience was like him really trying to help every startup, like trying to provide perspective. It brings such a different perspective every yeah. time. It's, it's kind of insane. It's like, it's, wow, where, where's like, this post coming from? Yeah. If, if, I mean, imagine if someone's seen the pattern recognition of like a thousand startups, it's, they, there's just things in their brain that, that, um, are very valuable. So he, um, he, you know, he challenged us in different ways or I, um, I remember asking him, like he said some kind comments and, um, and I remember asking him like, why, like, I felt at the time, like, we had no idea what we were doing. And so I remember asking him, like, why do you think we do, ha- like, why? Wh- why do you have so much Yes, yes. I remember asking him, like, because he actually, yeah, he, he, he said some very encouraging things. And, and, um, and I remember literally being like, why are you saying that? Like, <laughs> like why do you think we have anything figured out? And I, you Paul Graham, Paul Graham. Because I felt like we didn't. <laughs> and he said... He said, he, it was like a pattern recognition comment. He said, you know what, like, you guys, and he was talking about both Steph and I, kind of remind me of, like, these other super passionate design-oriented founders, like the founders of Airbnb or whatever, who, like, they have... Not a bad comparison. You, not a bad comparison. <laughs> where, where, like, where he was like, I believe that even if things are kind of cloudy for you right now, that you have, like, a, that you know something about the way this market is headed that maybe other people don't know. Like, that you have a special, a bit of special knowledge. And, and I'm not trying to be self-aggrandizing. He was not calling us the founder of Airbnb or something. But, he, but, but that was his answer. It was, like, it was like pattern recognition of, like, you might not know it yet, but it seems like you have some special knowledge about this area. Or you have what yeah. it takes to figure it out and kind of make the right decision yeah, to yeah, get yeah. you in the, the right Yeah, because you're position. really, truly passionate. You're the type of person to push through right. the challenges and actually figure it out. Totally. Um yeah, he wasn't guaranteeing that. He just that's what he said. Yeah. So you, so you uh, you're born and raised, you know, in Detroit. You moved yeah. to LA. This whole yeah. new life, and you you know go to, go, yeah. to, go to college, start a company. Now you're in San Francisco, um, yeah. which you were there at the time, right, for my Combinator, yes. or was it? Okay, we were so, just there for three months for the program. Okay. And so, then we came back so but here. you kind of experienced that yeah. city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, why did you kind of decide to still remain in LA versus you know you're kind of this whole like new market has opened up in San Francisco and yeah. I mean, every tech company's up there, like, or has some yeah. sort of presence there. It never, it really, honestly, never occurred to us to stay. And it's not a knock on San Francisco. I think it's that that's an incredible environment for yeah. for startups. But like the 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 diversity, like we love being down here um, because there's so much going on here. And our, I feel like we have customers in San Francisco and everywhere. But like. Um, to be around, to be closer to manufacturing, uh, to be closer to um, the like supply chain and logistics, like the port of Long Beach is the mm-hmm. second largest port in the country. Um, I, there's like some really practical, interesting reasons. And mm-hmm. then there's just like, we 
I don't know. Like we we never considered it. We we are like LA people. We mm-hmm. we this idea is like very practical, and it's like it's like an LA. It just feels like the DNA of this company mm-hmm. should be here. Um, and I don't know if that's a really apt description, but it's like um, honestly, it never crossed our minds to stay. <laughs> so you start this company uh, after you know you come back to LA after Y Combinator. What are some of the challenges that you run into? as, you know, a founder of this, you know, tech company? Yeah. I mean, probably, like, every challenge in the book. I don't know. <laughs> what, do, what do founders run into? Like, I mean, you know, the first year of running this company, we were really figuring it out. Um, I, I think that uh, there's – do you know um, – are you familiar with Chris Dixon? He, he's a um, – He's an investor and he has a great blog. I believe this is from his blog. I hope I'm getting this right. He has a um, blog post called The Idea Maze. Um, and uh, so I, I think I'm getting those details right. Uh, the And it's about the fact that some founders, some founders like have a great idea and they've like modeled it all out and then mm-hmm. they just go execute on it. And other founders go through like The Idea Maze. <laughs> and the, but the, the, there's a virtue to The Idea Maze, which just means like by the time you get through it, because you've tried every angle on your idea, Finally, like you hit on one, mm-hmm. and it and you really have a lot more clarity on why that idea is right because because you've tried all the other you know ones. All the, you know all the reasons <laughs> yeah. why it's wrong. Like yeah. you know all the reasons why the other things adjacent yeah. to it won't work, work yeah. because yeah. you've tried those too and mm-hmm. you failed at those. So mm-hmm. I think that we're Steph and I are a little bit more, at least for this concept, kind of went through the idea maze. And and so what problems did I run into? I came, we came back and, you know, we we're expected to grow a massive company. Um, and this is the first time you'd raised funding, right? This is the first yeah. time we'd raised funding. Um, and we, we had to figure it out. And I mean, and I mean, like we, the good news is we weren't new to being managers. We had run a company with employees. Like there's certain things that we didn't have to figure out that were really, it was great to mm-hmm. just not have to deal with that. But, but, but I mean, the, the pressure and the challenge of growing something that, you know, is supposed to be really large and impactful if you succeed is um there's no blueprint for that and then for good reason because if there was then it would immediately stop working because someone would do it and then you have to rip it apart so it's like i don't know what what is the sensation of coming back and you know having a little bit of money in the bank but realizing that you have to build you know hopefully a industry or world impacting company i mean i don't know you run into Everything is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, the, it's a better, good the, the, yeah. the, the more like the, the the quicker answer would be like what went right. Like I could probably like <laughs> list off three things, but what went wrong is like a thousand things. I can't yeah. list them off. Yeah, yeah just uh, <laughs> reacting and adapting. Right. Yeah, yeah you, you have to because um, there, there just is no blueprint for that. So I think we learned a tremendous amount that year, and we did find out some things that were worked, and 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 probably some of the best lessons that year came from listening to our customers who. When we were trying all of our other crazy ideas, they were like, we're having trouble with our packaging. And we we're like, oh, interesting. We'll deal with that later. Like, like you know, and then finally yeah. we we're like, oh, let's listen to these people. Like, we should help them with their packaging. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you're now in year eight, right? Um, well, so, well, sort yeah. of four, right? Three. This, this business is in its third year. Lumi.com. Lumi. Lumi.com. Lumi.com. And then Stefan and I have been working together for eight years. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. so let's say it's called three years. Uh-huh. Um, you know, you're at this point where you have some, you know, pretty big clients and amazing mm-hmm. clients um, that you're working with what's next for Lumi like where do you see it going from for the next like three to five years yeah I think it's kind of humbling to be in an industry that is so large that like what you're doing is kind of a drop in the bucket like the the you know the US market for packaging is like I mean it's just it's like we could throw around crazy numbers they're all massive numbers mm-hmm. so it's like hundreds of billions of dollars here and this and that and like mm-hmm. you know and so it's um I think w- What's interesting about that is you have to ask yourself about what the moves, whether the moves you're making now, um, like even if your numbers are good, like in startup parlance, like, you know, people are doubling and tripling and 25% month over month, like all their whatever goals, it, it's, it's all good stuff and everyone should be shooting for that stuff. But then if you extrapolate out the math, you still have to ask yourself, like, even if I do all of that, am I going to make a dent? Am I going to actually create a company that's impactful mm-hmm. or has market share um, or does something that matters to people? So I think that the what's next for Lumi is, like, keeping that in balance, right? Like, Lumi is growing, so things are working. But what does working mean, mm-hmm. right? Like, what does working mean? Does working mean you're profitable? Does working mean you reach that $100 million mark in sales? Like, everyone could give you a different random thing of, like, what working is. But so I think the hard part and what comes next, so to speak, is, like, 
to me, working, like the company working is continuing to hit milestones, but continuing to ask ourselves, what are we doing now that like really helps people, really provides a durable value where like seven years from now, 10 years Mm -hmm. from now, 15 years from now, we can point at that and be like, that's when that industry changed a bit. Like we pushed the needle, Mm -hmm. like we moved something. Um, and, And I think that's a tough question to keep asking it like it, it's an exhausting question to keep asking because the answer is like you're always not doing enough and but you have to um but I, it's just that balancing act of like trying to make sure you're still doing that um not just focusing on those milestones that are three months out or whatever mm-hmm. well i mean jesse's been having a great <laughs> conversation yeah. I mean, if you have any other questions this yeah. has been awesome yeah no i, I just um, i just love your energy and you know yeah it's it's very inspiring to see someone so young and you know, having done so much, you know, starting at 15, because, yeah. uh, you know, you see all that she's done, you see her product, and I think, I, you know, I encourage all our listeners to go check out the product and what they look like. I think it tells definitely more of a story once you see, you know, those boxes. You know, they're not yeah. just boxes, yeah. but yeah, they, they, they are. Yeah. But, you know, what it kind of carries and, you know, what, you know, emotions you feel when you're getting that package and opening it up i think is really kind of part of that magic that you guys are creating here um and we just want to thank you for you know sitting down with yeah. us yeah no this was great i really appreciate um totally. you guys uh, taking the time with me so totally. thanks for having me thanks yeah. jesse of course